Greetings, welcome back to Astral Gaster. Oh my god. Yeah. Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, has been arrested for plotting to kidnap the Queen and install himself as protector of the realm. Devereux is reported to have bribed a company of players to stage a revival of William Shakespeare's King Richard II, as the play invites treasonous comparison between the weak and incompetent King Richard and a present sovereign. Queen Elizabeth it was Devereux's intention to use it to rouse an angry mob and lead them to the gates of Kensington Palace. Failing to master sufficient support from the London populace, however, Devereux was compelled to return home to Essex House, where he was arrested. Oh, and he'll be dead soon, I think. Uh, pray tell, how did things fare with your gentleman friend, uh, Owen Wood? Not my fault. I couldn't make a different choice. All over betwixt me and Dean Wood. I did ask him for a small loan, and he was most insulting oh. about it. We have not spoken since. And I think I know why his ardour for me has cooled. For I did lately learn that he has been bedding half the women in the diocese. Ah, uh, yes. I too did lately hear of this. So, your stars were very wrong to tell me I had nothing to fear from other women Not my fault. Woods affections. But this day I am come about my husband. Methinks he is ill, yet he pretends he is not. He is. Pray describe his symptoms to me. Well, yesterday I did remark that something was amiss when Molly Macdoon and I returned from the playhouse. For there was a special performance of Richard II at the Globe. Know you of it? Or tis the play that makes the Queen look bad? Mm. I know of it. When I came in the door, there was an awful racket coming from our upstairs rooms. I went to see what the matter was and found my husband tucked up a bed, moaning and wailing and with a monstrous rash all over his face. He told me some nonsense about having been stung by wasps and that he is merely tired. But I do not believe him. I see. I bid you, Foreman, tell me true, for I grow ill with worry. Is it... Grave? I think so. I could better not think of dying on me afore he has paid his debts. Ah, for as his widow, by law, you would inherit them, would you not? Uh, but mayhap there is little to worry about. Let us consult the stars and see. What ails Thomas Blagg, the Dean of Rochester? But do we really did that? Why won't you just tell her? Thomas Blagg is troubled with the melancholy, a disease characterized by much woe and a preference for many in bed. Thomas Black is suffering from swelling in the cards. Thomas Black is ill with erysipelas, a disease characterized for bodily pain and redness of the nose and neck. I am afraid your husband is ill with a disease known as erysipelas. He is in grave danger. Indeed, his case is advanced and beyond treatment. There is nothing to be done now, but prepare yourself for his death, Mistress Black. Madam? Alice? Don't faint. Come, Alice. I will find you a chair. Nay, I, I, I must not tarry. I am meeting Mistress Macdoon at the bear for a quiet one. Good day, Foreman. But Alice... Yes, yeah, she did not ye, hint. Ye. Traitor lose his head after losing mind. Earl of Essex gets the chop for treason. On this day, the 25th day of February, in the year of our Lord 1601, Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, was executed for treason. The execution follows yesterday's trial at which he was found guilty of leading a failed plot against the realm. Formerly a favourite of both Her Majesty and the London public, the Earl's surprising betrayal of both Queen and country has shocked the nation. <laughs> nice, okay, how are we with Mary? Bad. 
Well met, Mistress Payne. How fare you this day? Most well indeed, sir, for I am just come from taking my niece on an outing to Tower Hill. Twas to see the execution of the traitor Robert Devereux. Ah, yes, Lord Devereux. What a tragic end to a promising career. And such a lovely beheading they gave us. My niece and I very much enjoy the hangings at Tyburn, but a beheading is so much more elegant, is it not? Verily, mm. it is a better class of execution, I find. And the royal executioner did go down on Devereux with such skill. A single stroke was all it took to give us the traitor's head. Aye, tis true the royal executioner gives excellent... But I have no time to tarry here and gossip with you, Dr. Ford. Of course. Come on a matter of great concern. And you are just the man to help me, thinks. For your prediction yes. that Elizabeth's reign would endure was true. Whilst the Queen does have the appearance of being naught but a painted corpse propped up on a throne using artfully placed cushions, she is, in law at least, still alive. Praised be! Ah, Didn't you call Praised her a whore and before? What is this new matter that concerns you? Tis that England is filling up with foreigners. Indeed, tis been going on for so many years now that in London, tis rare to hear anyone discoursing in the English tongue anymore. The city is crawling with continentals. And then I take it you do not enjoy your visits to the city of London. Oh nay, I have never been to London. For as I did just say, tis crawling with continentals. And Lambeth will soon suffer the same fate if we do not act. Why, only the other day, I spied a continental on the high street. A monstrous ogre of a man he was. And as for his face... His eyelashes were so fair, he had the appearance of having none at all. Ah, yes, the Netherlanders. It is true the people of the Netherlands can be fair of hair and tall of stature. And tis surely no coincidence that Lambeth has suffered an increase in crime of late. We do not feel it is a coincidence. Every night we ladies of Four Street do shiver in our beds at the thought of these frighteningly large men. I do not doubt it, madam. Now, let us see whether the stars might allay or confirm your fears. Should the residents of Lambeth be concerned about an influx of continentals? Not really, but let me check whether I... how many I still have. Why I still have three? Okay, let's see. Some continentals are lying about why they are in Lambeth. They are come here to rob Lambeth residents of our household possessions. We must not be deceived. Lambeth residents' relationship with the continental immigrants is in danger of turning violent. Our duty lies with our domestic concerns, which should take priority. Our queen has been waging war on the continent. Unpleasantness in the name of religion has caused death and destruction. The residents of Lambeth are being somewhat hypocritical. The stars advise countering this hypocrisy. Continental immigration will enrich England's legacy with culture and innovation. Youths who have lost their sense of youths who have lost their sense of discipline are involved. It's either this one or this one. Usually, I think the I'll go with this one. Hmm. Madam, I may assure you that if there be a rise in criminality. The Continentals are not to blame. Then who is to blame? May I suggest... the youth of this day? The youth of this day are customarily blamed for social ills, and in this instance it would seem justified, at least according to the stars. As for the Continentals, it appears that elements of their culture and expertise may one day serve to enrich ours. Consider, for example, the additional dining options they have brought with them to England. Indeed, do we English not tire of our dreary custards and dull mutton roasts? Hmm. Well, in truth, I am a little partial to their... What are those puffy pancake things with the crisscrosses on them? Waffles, I believe. Aye, I will own I am partial to those Netherland waffles. But pish, Dr. Foreman! You learned men and fancy folk may discourse all you like about having your dinner tables enlivened with foreign cookery, but who is it that suffers when desperate continentals go a-robbing our houses and a-troubling our women? Tis us ordinary folk, tis who? I will have my husband write to Lambeth Palace and tell the Archbishop we will have no more of these continentals in Lambeth. Blessed day, Dr. Paul. Okay, go write a letter. I don't really care about your letter of recommendation. 
Manchester Cathedral dies. New Deep pledges to refurnish empty cathedrals. Hear ye! Local residents were saddened this day by tidings of the death of Thomas Black, Dean of Rochester Cathedral. He leaves behind a wife, Alice Black, and children John, Thomas Cornwallis, Edmund, Nicholas, and Francis. Hey, Mr. Bell, and well met. I recall you were hoping for a pay rise. How did that go? Well, I got a pay rise, innit? I took your advice about banding together with the other hired men and gabbing about how much coin we was getting. Turns out, another one of the lads weren't getting paid enough for his lady parts neither. So, we all refused to do our rehearsals until the boss man fixed it. Well done, Mr. Bell. I must say I am most proud of you. But this day, I am come about my skin. It is so clapped, I need twice as much ceruse as normal. Ah, yes. Venetian ceruse. The white lead and vinegar paste ladies and players use to whiten their faces. You have to fix it for me, Doctor, for my role in Mr. Shakespeare's new play. I'm to play a lady who disguises herself as a lawyer. A lady cunningly disguised as a lawyer? <laughs> Unbelievable. So but I see not why you need worry over your complexion. Having a sound grasp of Latin and a, a talent for eloquence are the usual qualifications of a legal advocate, are they not? Is it verily necessary for this lawyer to have beauty as well? Well, Mr. Burbage seems to think so. These are enlightened times, and we must have confidence in our audience that they will accept, even welcome, the notion of a lady of learning, as long as she be lovely enough to lie with. I see. And tis true your skin is looking a little less than lovely at present. Let us see if we may find a remedy for it in the stars. What is the matter with Humphrey Bell's face? <laughs> what may be done to improve its appearance? I love the way this question was asked, really. Humphrey suffers from melancholy, a condition that can make the skin appear pale in appearance and induce fanciful imagining in the mind. Humphrey suffers from this temperature of the liver occasioned by some kind of poison. Humphrey's trouble of ugliness. Oh my god, really? No, I would say it's about the riv liver thing. Stars indicate that your skin really? By the paste you're applying to your face. The lead it contains is causing your scab and if I am Thank honest, you. some thinning in your hair. But these are merely indications of a greater trouble it is causing. A distemperature of the liver. You must no longer apply lead to your face, Mr. Bell. What do you mean, like, tis poisonous or something? Yes. Oh, nay, that is not poisonous. You merely seem to have a sensitivity to it, is all. I will write you up a prescription to take to an apothecary. He will concoct you a paste from alum, tin ash, and sulfur. No! A replacement for the ceruse you have been using. Don't! And to hide the damage to your skin, you might apply the white of a raw egg to your face. That's we'll a bit better. Glaze over your complexion. So all this will fix my face, yeah? So, I think it's kind of Dr. Foreman. I have a bad feeling about that. I think he, it would rather worsen his skin condition. Oh, not you again. Doubtless I need not explain why you have been brought before the College of Physicians this day. We have been informed that you persist in practicing medicine without a license, in defiance of the law and in spite of previous warnings given you by myself and my distinguished colleagues. How do you answer this charge? Uh... Well, what do you have to say for yourself, Sirrah? I say... I say that I am a good doctor. You're and not. that my many years of experience have allowed me to perfect my methods as a true physician. <laughs> you would dare speak of your methods, Mr. Foreman. We are informed that you write your patients' names and complaints in a notebook. Doubtless all the better to blackmail them with. Ah, yes, my case books. 
Indeed, sir. It is most useful to be able to remember a Quirin's history. Furthermore, you use astrological readings not simply to predict the course of an illness or judge the best time for a treatment, as good medicine teaches us, but you find the cause of the disease in the stars. You refuse to examine your patient's urine for this purpose. Well, yes, for... And you would dare claim that in these past years you have gained medical knowledge and skill from mere experience? <laughs> Then I invite you to provide proof of it now. You will submit to an examination. No, which humor does Saturn rule over? Um, hmm, I wonder. Don't really remember. I would say the yellow bile. Hmm. Hmm. Saturn, I would say the yellow bile. I'm always wrong with the first one. Someone with excessive bug by my exhibit. Melancholic. Controls intelligence. Um, love. No, I would say Jupiter. Oh. Who rules the head? Aries? Of course, they will always love at me this examination and thereby have proved yourself unfit to practice medicine mm. remove this charlatan this carnival quack from my sight what again i demand to speak with my legal counsel you will regret this we should pay more attention to what happens there with the science sir it was with shock and distress that i did learn of your current situation but worry not dr foreman uh, for you will be freed from jail this very day. I bade my husband, Lord Dyer, exert his, exert his influence on your behalf, but I must warn you that the College of Physicians cannot be abstracted for long and that you verily ought to produce, procure a medical license. Your current and most assured friend, Lady Emma Dyer. Well met, Alice, dear friend. Since your husband's death, I have oft thought of you. Fare you well? Oh, Foreman, I am sorry for not coming to see you sooner, for I was grateful for your warning about Blag's illness. It gave me the sense to bide with him in his final hours. It was only then that I did realise how much I did love the old fool. Despite his mump-headed nature and his leaving me and the children with not a penny between us. But the day after he passed, I came upon a note he had writ for me. I warrant that was your idea, was it, Foreman? It may have been. Then I thank ye for it, Simon. It was a comfort to be left something to remember him by, even if it be the only thing he did leave me. But things are better since I did become Mistress Maze. Then you have remarried? Aye. T'was the only means of putting a roof over our heads and meat in our bellies. And Mr. Maysay is a kind man. Oh, but Foreman, we may not have our roof much longer. Maysay has threatened to leave me. The brute! Well, to be fair, I suppose I did fail to apprise him of the full extent of Blag's debts, which are, as you know, not inconsiderable. But what am I to do about it now? Ah, yes, of course. By marrying you, he is now responsible for the debts of your late husband, according to the law. In sooth, tis a high price to pay for a wife. No matter the marital bliss, her bountiful charms and fine qualities do doubtless afford him. Ah, oh, save it for another day, Foreman. Tis not your chub-brained flattery I am come for. Tis your counsel. Then let us see if the stars may offer a solution. Yeah, of How course. may Alice may say prevent her husband petitioning for a divorce? By giving me the letter of recommendation? Yeah, this is... Oh, I wanted to check whether this was the last one. Yeah, it's the last one, so we must be right. Mr. Mace feels nervous about being burdened with Thomas Black's debts and angry toward us as a result. Okay, let's see. Mars means anger. Neptune... Neurotism. 
A family trip may turn things around, Jupiter. Okay. God is punishing the deceased Thomas Black by visiting the evil sins of the father upon his widow and children. Thomas Black's legacy is the depths he has burdened his widow with. Alice must be realistic and temper her hopes. No, I would just go on the trip. You have little hope of calming your new husband's feelings about your late husband's debts. But the stars suggest that your family might go abroad and thus put yourself out of the reach of Black's creditors. You must do this without delay. Go abroad? You mean where foreigners live? Yes. Hey, my chart also suggests that you find some creative solution to ensure your husband's cooperation in such a project. Has he ever expressed an interest in the New World colonies? Or perchance you might suggest an extended tour of Roman antiquities? Ah. Nay, but I will put my mind to it. But if we do go abroad, this is doubtless the last time I shall ever see you, Foreman. You're welcome. Give me that. Thanks. This is the sixth one. One, two, three, four, five. It's seventh one. Yes, we are nearly there. All England is in mourning as news spreads to the death of the death of our beloved sovereign. Queen Elizabeth Tudor, often referred to as Good Queen Bess by her subjects, expired of natural causes on this day, the 24th day of March, the year of our Lord 1603. Although Her Majesty left no heir nor named a successor, her cousin and nearest blood relation, 57-year-old James Stewart, King of Scotland, is rumored to be traveling down from Edinburgh to the crowned king to be crowned the King of England later this week. I think I did wrong with him. Congratulate you on your performance of the Camley Lady Lawyer in the Merchant of Venice. Okay. He thinks your skin is much improved. It is verily glowing. I, Dr. Foreman, changing my lead paste for sulfur work very well. Mistress Burbage says I now look a picture of beauty. Did she now? Forsooth, it is well to hear the troubles with your skin are resolved. Now, what is it you come for this day? Mr. Shakespeare has written a new play, and I need to look younger if I'm to get a good part in it. It is about an ancient Roman general called Titus Andronicus. I wish to play the role of his comely mother, the Lady Tamara. You need to look younger in order to play a man's mother, you say? But according to my casebook, why, sir, you are not yet five and twenty years of age. Aye, sir, indeed. Tis but the business of playing, though, isn't it? At least, according to Mr. Burbage, he was well vexed when I pointed out how the man played Titus is near as old as I am. If the stage is not to your liking, Mr. Bell, I invite you to seek employment elsewhere. All right then, let us see what the stars are Oh my god. ...done to make my querent Humphrey Bell appear younger. Cut his legs right beneath the knees. Humphrey must undergo a transformation to repair the damage Time's legacy has wrought. That sounds wrong. Good angels have bestowed upon Humphrey the talent of artistry, which he can use to improve the appearance of his face. This advises that something refined that has been obtained from a foreign country can help him appear younger, but there is cru cruelty involved. It is God's will that Humphrey embraces his masculinity as he matures. Humphrey is out of touch with reality, he cannot reverse the aging process and look younger. Humphrey's bosses are impossible to please. Yeah, that's true. And Humphrey should be pessimistic about his ability to first aging. Hmm. 
Uh, maybe this one or this. Not undergo transformation. Okay, I will go with this one. We must address your problem scientifically, Mr. Bell. Youth is characterized by sanguinity, governed by the humor blood. Therefore, transfusion. The appearance of having an abundance of blood oh, okay. in your cheeks and lips, for instance. So how do I do that? With insects. Eh? What? One moment while I fetch a pot of them from my cabinet. Now, these are what are called cochineal beetles. Do not be afeard, for they are dead. Okay. They have been shipped here from the new world. You must crush a hand. Oh, the red beetles. It Mix it with water and then apply it to your cheeks and lips. Beetle juice on my face? I will not lie, that sounds mad. I'll give it a try though. We are nearly there. No. What? Good morrow, Mistress Fortescue. How may I do you, sir? Oh, Dr. Foreman, I have urgent need of your advice. Oh, woe! I know not what I am to do. On my word, madam, I have never before seen you in such a state. Uh, pray tell, whatever can the matter be? Tis my husband, Captain Fortescue. God mend me! He has been implicated in a conspiracy to commit treason! Ah, yes, your husband, Captain Henry Fortescue. He is a great friend of Sir Walter Raleigh, is he not? Oh, methinks I see your problem. For Raleigh has been implicated in a plot against our new king, has he not? Tis said the plotters wished to oust the king and install the king's cousin on the throne. Or was Raleigh involved in that other plot? The one to kidnap the king and force him to appoint a more religiously tolerant privy council. In truth, there are so many plots against the English throne these days, tis hard to keep abreast of them all. Indeed, I know not which plot Sir Walter was arrested for, but I have heard tell that the privy council seeks to find conspirators amongst his associates. Hence, I have been hiding my husband in our cellar and pretending he's still away at sea. But why would your husband fear arrest? Was he involved in Sir Walter Raleigh's plot? Nay, he was not. But all London believes that he and Sir Walter are very great friends. Ah, yes. I see. But what of your own friends, Mistress Fortescue? All those lords, ladies and bishops who have so oft graced your table, would they not speak in your husband's defence? Well, dear Emma says she will speak for my husband, but alas, she now has little influence at court on account of some, well, some scandals of her own. As for my other acquaintances, they have all disowned me. They decline my invitations, and no one is at home to me when I call upon them. Even Sir Munchalot has stopped speaking to me. Even your parrot, madam? On my word, that is very cold. I beseech you, sir, read the stars and tell me how I might save my husband from arrest. Pray assure me he will be safe. Let us see, then. Is Captain Henry Fortescue in danger of being arrested for treason? If so, what might Mistress Fortescue do to prevent it? Keep him hidden in your cellar? Basement. Simple Fortescue is deluded and has lost touch with reality. God will punish Captain Fortescue violently for his part in this conspiracy. The Fortescue family's reputation is dead, they will go down in history as traitors. The king will soon be waging a violent war in a foreign country, thus distracting him from hunting for Riley's co-conspirators. Mistress Fortescue may be optimistic about her husband's fate, for the plot against the king will soon be taken far less seriously than it is now. Despite what she may think, Sybil Fortescue can still use her social authority and influence influential relationships to aid her husband. The intelli intelligent course is forcible to keep her distress a secret from the world and behave as if she has nothing to fear. Okay, we are done with her, so I will go with that. Madam, although your friends in the royal court may no longer own you in public, a chance they could be prevailed upon to act on your behalf in private. Verily, madam, I urge you to write to them and bid them use their influence in your family's favor. 
may have they can quietly speak well of your husband to the king and to the lords of the Privy Council. In the meantime, you must behave as if you have nothing to fear or be ashamed of. As if your husband is full innocent of treason. Hold your head high, Mistress Fortescue. But I... Oh, Dr. Foreman, surely you see how low I am come. Yep. Madam. Have you not before suffered the slings and arrows of social misfortune and yet risen victorious? Well, I... You had a house full of guests purging from all their orifices, and yet you did not waver. You suffered an attack upon your mucosal membrane by the most fiendish of New World fruits, those known to affright the bravest of conquistadors, and yet you soldiered on. And after you played the fool before lords, bishops, and countesses, still they thronged for invitations to your luncheons. Truly, madam, are you not a leader amongst women? Reclaim your place at London's dinner tables and use it to save your husband. Take back your Camelot. Indeed, sir. I shall not be cowed by spiteful wagging tongues any longer. I now go forth to restore my husband's honour and our family's good name. Fare you well and Godspeed. Off you go. Fortescue. This is not going to end well. Oh well. And this was the last one. Okay. And she was very pleased with that. Hey, but we're going to end this part here. Thank you very much. Stay alive and see you soon.